Hello everyone. This is going to be The Yearling Chapter 8. I think. Hang on just a second. Let me make sure I got the right chapter here. I know it's a little dark. I'm reading by candlelight today. <clears throat> yes, The Yearling Chapter 8. So, I hope you can see me a little bit. But it's not me. It's the story that I want you to hear. Not necessarily see me. The story's getting really, really good. And this is a very important chapter. So, The Yearling by Marjorie Kennan Rawlings, Chapter 8. Jody clicked a gate behind him. The unmistakable smell of roasting meat filled the air. He ran around the side of the cabin. Resentment was mixed with his eagerness. Resisting the open kitchen door, he hurried to his father. Penny stepped out of the smokehouse and hailed him. The truth, a tangle, pain, and pleasure was before him. Before him. A large deer hide was stretched on the smokehouse wall. Jody wailed. You been hunting and you didn't wait on me? He stamped his foot. I ain't never going to leave you go off without me again. Easy, son, to you here. Be proud things come so beautiful and so bountiful. His wrath cooled. Curiosity bubbled like a spring. Tell me quick, Pa, how come? Penny sat down on his heels in the sand. Jody dropped flat beside him. A buck, Jody. I knew about run him down. Again, he was furious. Why did it wait till I got home? Didn't you pleasure yourself with the foresters? You can't get all your coons up one tree. It could have waited. There ain't never enough time. He'd go too fast. Penny laughed. Well, son, you, nor me, nor man, ain't never yet learned how to halt it. Were the buck running? Jody, I'll declare I ain't never had meat stand and wait for me. The way that buck stood in the road, he didn't pay the horse no mind. Just stood there. My th first thought was, tarnation, and me with no shells to my new gun. Then I unbreached the gun and looked in, and bless heaven, I might have known the Forrester would have a gun full loaded. There was two shells in the gun, and there stood the buck just waiting. I cracked down, and he dropped right in the road, handy as a sack of meal. I hissed him over to old Caesar's rump, and away we goed. Tell you what come to me, me bringing in venison. I figured Ma won't crawl, won't crawl me for leaving Jody with fodder wing. What did she say when she see the new gun and the meat? She said, if twas anybody but an honest fool like you, I'd swear you'd been out thieving. They chuckled together. The odors from the kitchen were savory. The hours with the foresters were forgotten. There was no reality but the day's din dinner. Jody went into the kitchen. Hey, Ma, I'm home. Well, must I laugh or cry? Her ample figure was bent over the hearth. The day was warm and sweat ran down her heavy neck. We got us a shooting paw, ain't we, Ma? Yes, and a good thing, too, you would off all the time. Ma, what is it? We eating venison today. She turned from the fire. Merciful heaven, don't you ever think of nothing but your empty belly? You cook venison so good, Ma. She was mollified. We eating it today. I was fitted it not keep and the weather warm. The liver will not keep neither. Well, for pity's sake, we can't eat everything to once. If you'll fill my wood box this evening, could we eat liver tonight? 
He prowled among the dishes. Get out in my kitchen, unless you want to torment me to death. Then what do you do for dinner? I'd cook it. Yes, you and the dogs. He ran out of the house to his father. How's old Julia? It seemed to him he had been away a week. Doing fine. Give her a month and she'll have old Slewfoot hollering. Is the foresters aiming to campus hunt him? We never come to no agreement. But brother, they hunted their way and leave me hunt mine. I don't much care who gets him long as we keep him off and off stock. Pa, I never told you. I was scared when the dogs was fighting him. I was too scared to even run. It didn't pleasure me none, neither, when I found I didn't have me a gun. But you told it to the Forsters like, like as if we was mighty bold-hearted. Well, son, that's what makes a tale. Jody examined the deer hide. It was large and handsome, red with spring. The game seemed for him to be two different animals. On the chase, it was the quarry. He wanted only to see it fall. When it lay dead and bleeding, he was sickened and sorry. His heart ached over the mangled death. Then, when it was cut into portions and dried and salted and smoked or boiled or baked or fried in the savory kitchen or roasted over the campfire, it was only meat, like bacon, and his mouth watered at its goodness. He wondered by what alchemy it was changed, so that what sickened him one hour maddened him with hunger the next. It seemed as though there were neither, either two different animals or two different boys. The hides did not change. They kept their aliveness. Whenever he stepped with bare feet on the soft deer skin beside his bed, he half expected to feel it start under him. Penny, small body though he was, had a scattering of black hair across his thin chest. As a boy, he had slept naked in, in winter in a bear skin with the fur next to him. Ma Baxter said he had grown hair on his chest from so sleeping. It was her joke, but Jody half believed it. The clearing was filled as abundantly as the foresters. His mother had ground the slaughtered sow into sausage. Stuffed casings hung in the smokehouse. A slow hickory fire smoked under them. Penny left his work to drop a few chips of wood on the smoldering embers. Jody said, Must I chop wood or finish hoeing the corn? Now, Jody, you know good and well I couldn't let the weeds take the corn. Finished the ho I finished the hoeing. Wood's the thing. He was glad to go to the woodpile, for if he did not do something to occupy his mind, hunger would force him to gnaw the jog dog's alligator meat or pick up the chicken scraps of cornbread. The time went slowly at first, and he was tormented with the desire to follow his father's activities. Then Penny disappeared in the, in the mule lot, and Jody swung the axe without distraction. He carried an armful of wood to his mother as an excuse to see how dinner was progressing. He was relieved to see it on the table. She was pouring the coffee. Call your pa, she said, and wash them terrible hands. I guarantee you ain't touched water since you left home. Penny came at last. The ham of venison filled the center of the table. He drew his carving knife with maddening deliberation across the meat. Jody said, I'm so hungry, my belly thinks my throat is cut. Penny laid down the knife and looked at him. Ma Baxter said, Now that ain't a pretty something to say. Why'd you learn to say that? Well, that's what the foresters say. I noted, it. That's the kind of thing you learn of them low-down rascals. They ain't low down, Ma. Every one of them's lower than a doodle bug and black hearted to boot. They ain't black hearted. They're purely friendly, Ma. They fiddle and play and sing better than, better than the fiddler's convention. We was up long before day singing and frolicking. It was fine. That's all right if they got nothing better to do. Meat was before them, piled high on the plates. The Baxters fell too. 
And that is the end of chapter 8. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace.